Problems with probability. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the conversation. I'm David Schuster. There is a growing concern across the issues of math and science and research. A number of investigators have determined that they're having what's known as a replication crisis. I'll give you an example. Basically, replication crisis is you can't repeat something that was done several years ago and find the same sort of data that it doesn't hold true. So for example, several years ago, there was a study that found that if you force people to smile by putting a pen in their mouth, well, they would, they would smile for a period of time and it would make them happier. But when the same experiment was done decades later, the researchers, after doing it with 2,000 people, found that the data did not show that at all. So there's a fundamental theory that something has gone terribly wrong across society with how we use data. And here to talk about that is Dr. Aubrey Clayton. He is a mathematician, teacher, a uh, philosophy of probability and statistics at the Harvard Extension School. His book is Bernoulli's Fallacy. Bernoulli was a mathematician from several hundred years ago, sort of like the founding father of statistics. And uh, Dr. Clayton, uh, I imagine that's part of the problem here. Yes, it is. That's right. So the book traces the history of a mistaken idea of probability and statistics that originated with Jacob Bernoulli about 300 years ago. So it's a very long history and a rich history. And unfortunately, now that mistake is incredibly widespread and, and embedded in the standard methods of statistics as they're used across experimental science and, and in many other domains. So how does that manifest itself? I gave the example about you know research about how did one makes how, you know how you decide whether uh, something might make somebody happy with a smile, but how does it manifest itself with sort of the very serious issues uh, facing our society today? Yeah, so the, the essence of the fallacy, um, as I describe in the book, is that the probability statements that people use to draw conclusions from data, be it observational data, experimental data, evidence at a, a crime scene, what have you, um, all those probability statements are oriented in the wrong direction. So essentially, they all start from an assumption of a hypothesis, say, that a scientific theory is true or that a suspect committed a crime or that a patient has a disease. And then they can tell you the probability of certain observations based on that. How often would such a person test positive for the disease, let's say. Um, but the correct direction to really be using to draw conclusions is the other way around. We're not always interested in how likely is it that you would get a certain observation if, let's say, a theory were true. What we want to know is given a certain observation, What's the probability we assign to that theory being true, say, uh, someone truly having a disease? And in the case of um, experimental science, that amounts to saying things like, what's the probability that you can really make somebody happy by forcing them to smile? And in order to do that assessment, you need to bring into the calculation the prior knowledge that you have of that theory. You have to have an assignment for the probability that you'd say that theory is true without interpreting the data yet. And that's called the prior probability, which in Bayesian statistics is a core component, is not used in the standard mode of statistics um, that's that's um, dominant today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about Bayesian statistics in just a moment, but let's use another example. You mentioned a law enforcement crime. There was a famous case that you point out in your book in which a woman was convicted, even though she was innocent. She was convicted of murdering her two children because both kids died from SIDS, and the argument was, well, that's a statistical improbability, impossibility that she could that she could have two children die from SIDS. And you point out in the book that that was the wrong way to look at it. Explain why. Yes, that's right. So the person you're referring to was Sally Clark, who was wrongfully convicted of the murder of her two infant children because they died a few years apart very unexpectedly. And the key piece of evidence that was presented at her trial was that for uh, a couple in a family such as hers, it would be very, very unlikely to have two children die of SIDS. Um, so that is to say by chance without there being um, some kind of foul play. And that argument has the probability oriented in the wrong direction. It is to say, if she was not guilty of murdering her children, it would be very, very unlikely that they would die for other reasons. Um, where the, the correct direction that they should have been asking at the trial is given that they died, What's the probability that we would assign to the theory that she was a murderer? And in order to do that assignment, you would have to take into consideration, for example, the fact that it's very, very unlikely for two children to die of homicide in a family as well. And so the, the prior probability, the probability that we'd assign to that hypothesis or that theory of the case itself should have been extremely low. 
And in the end, what we're trying to do is balance or find the balance between two competing theories of the case, given this extremely unlikely evidence that we, um, we've observed. Now, there are people in law enforcement and across the scientific world who would say, okay, let's use that example that maybe there's nothing wrong with looking at her based on the odds or the probability that somebody would have two children die from SIDS, but that that should not be a factor at trial. Do you agree with that? That at least that can be perhaps the first clue or the first reason to trigger some investigation based on something that seems so highly improbable? It should certainly be part of the larger calculation. So absolutely the fact that it's a very unlikely occurrence. The number presented at her trial was um, that the chances were one in 73 million to have two children die of unexplained causes uh, within the same family. And that can be an ingredient to sussing out and, and investigating the different kinds of possibilities and coming to a conclusion about whether she was likely um, guilty of the crime she was accused of. The point that, that I am trying to make in the book, and I think what is clear when you actually kind of think through the logic of that argument is that that can't be the end point. You also have to take into consideration that it's very unlikely from the start that just a random person off the street would be a double murderer or um, you know, any other kind of theory that you have to explain the case. You have to uh, weigh the, the balance of probability for that theory against um, the theory of random chance or in this case, SIDS. So it's, it's an ingredient, but it's only one ingredient of many. And the problem with these statistical methods that try to argue from just that one probability is that they leave out all of the other pertinent information. How does this work out then against something that's you know topical like say COVID and whether or not people should get vaccines or whether people should wear masks? Yeah, so well, one, one way that it plays out in COVID that I think everyone probably is familiar with now having been through um, a year and a half of testing is that we might have, for example, test statistics or um, statistics that describe the accuracy rates of tests. And those can tell you, for example, if someone has the virus, what's the probability that they'll test positive for it? Or if they don't, what's the probability that they'll test negative? But in order to um, make an actionable decision from a test result, you really need to know then what's the probability given the test result that you have the virus. And it's the turning that probability around the other way um, is the key, the key idea. And in order to do that, you have to include things like what symptoms do you have? What kinds of exposure levels have you had? What are the case rates like in your community? And if those aren't part of your calculation, then you're doing the probability assignment incorrectly. Would that also here. include say family medical history, whether you have underlying conditions or the whole sort of gamut that it's not just about, okay, you test positive, therefore it means you have COVID. It's well, what, what, what are all the other factors that may be at play in your particular case, is that fair? Yes, exactly, that's right. So it, 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 the same dynamic is at play in say the clinical trials of the vaccine effectiveness or uh, any other kind of drug effectiveness that from the beginning there should be an, ass an assessment of what's the likelihood that this drug is effective before we've taken into consideration the data. So if you are, for example, doing a trial, a clinical trial on a new vaccine, and you are comparing that to a clinical trial on a homeopathic remedy, you should start from the point of view of a higher prior probability for the vaccine being effective than you would for a crystal or you know, homeopathic remedy. And the, the problem with scientific statistics is that it doesn't include that kind of foreknowledge. And that gets to the Bayesian approach, which is another philosophy, another sort of strand of statistical analysis, but suggests that you should incorporate prior knowledge when trying to reason with incomplete information. In the case of say COVID-19 and vaccines, as you mentioned, it would say, well, wait a second, given all the progress that has been made with these vaccines, we start at this particular baseline. The problem with that is that there are some people who are anti science men who may say, well, what about the fact that you're you're cooking the books now? Yeah, and I think that that's, that's a, a fairly cynical way to look at it. I would make the argument the other way, which is to say that um, by not taking advantage of the accumulated knowledge that we have as scientists and as a scientific community, we're essentially artificially leveling the playing field and cooking the books the other way. We're giving um, theories that really have no basis in scientific fact too great of a chance to prove themselves through the data. So like the, the social psychology theory you mentioned of, forcing someone to be happy by putting a pen in their teeth. We should assign that a very low prior probability because we have a kind of world history and we have accumulated knowledge about 
people and the way that their psychology works that should allow us to discount that possibility. Not completely, we could still allow ourselves to be convinced of it, but we just need to raise the bar for theories that contradict kind of our prior understanding of the world. And that's as it should be. And finally, real quickly here, and I know we're running short on time. Um, how would this play out in terms of looking in the future if scientists and researchers use the Bayesian approach? Would it cost a lot more? Would it fundamentally change how research is done, how research is interpreted? Well, it would fundamentally change how research is um, interpreted and explained and the kind of statistical arguments that are used to support research. Uh, my argument in the book is actually that it would be in the end, a great cost savings to researchers because there's an enormous amount of money that's wasted on failed studies that that don't replicate or on the replication studies themselves to establish whether those things were legitimate in the first place. And by using the data more efficiently through Bayesian methods, actually a lot of money could be saved, a lot of time and effort could be saved and scientists could get, get back to doing the business of real science. Dr. Aubrey Clayton, the book is Bernoulli's Fallacy. Dr. Clayton, thanks so much for joining us, we appreciate it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Got it. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.